We respectfully acknowledge that we are gathering in the traditional sovereign territory of Indigenous Coast Salish people, Alumni and Nipsack, prepared for these lands and waters since time immemorial and continue to do so today. Their presence is imbued in these mountains, valleys, waterways, and shorelines. May we honor the original stewards of this place and participate in the care and protection of our shared home. Good evening and welcome, friends. Thank you so much for being here with us today, tonight. We are the Bellingham Quaker meeting. And in our Quaker tradition, we present queries which enlighten and beg questions to foster thought and much activism in our community. After each query or participant, we have some silence to reflect on what has been shared and to think about what your thoughts are on the information that was provided. We believe in equality and listening to gain a better perspective on the light that we know is in all of us. Currently, we have over 200 participants, audience members here this evening. That is tremendous and we welcome you all. Thank you so much for being here. This evening, each panel will be invited to speak up to 10 minutes. Each panelist will have a few minutes to respond to others. Attendees will get a chance in the last half hour to make comments and ask questions by putting them in the Q&A box. They will be moderated. There may not be time for all of them, but our Q&A monitor writer will do his best to summarize and include as many viewpoints and concerns as we as time will allow. And additionally, feedback at the end can be brought through the bellinghamfriends.org website. The panelists this evening, and we are very pleased to have them with us, are Jonathan Randolph, Ms. Shirley Williams, Ms. Rosalinda Guillen, Ms. Flo Simon, and Mr. Scott Paul Sidhu. Well, thank you once again for joining us. And now we'll begin by, I'll introduce Mr. Jonathan Randolph. Jonathan is the founder of Startup Monumental Onyx, a construction management firm, and is a world traveler, a professional singer, and a senior health advocate and caregiver. After recently obtaining his BS in construction management from Morgan State University in Maryland, he relocated to Bellingham to pursue a new life on the West Coast. Jonathan believes that through combating institutional racism and building a constructive dialogue about community needs, Bellingham will be a leading example for the nation. Now here is Mr. Jonathan Randolph. Good evening, everyone. I would like to start this discussion with a moment of silence. A moment of silence for George Floyd and the countless individuals whom we've lost in our quest for justice. Thank you. In the spirit of this panel, I would like to quote Lucretia Mott, who was known as an anti-slavery advocate and women's rights activist. She said, my conviction led me to adhere to the sufficiency of the light within us, resting on truth for authority, not on authority for truth. I would like to thank everyone in attendance for their time on this panel. And my hope is that the opinions and solutions we create, we share create opportunities for empathy, change and justice for all people of color in Bellingham. Given the movement for social justice sweeping our nation, I represent the quiet voice of the African-American experience. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I represent the quiet voice of the African-American experience here in Bellingham. And I look to shed light and address with you all tonight, our needs, concerns, and hope for the future. Bellingham is home for me. As a new resident here, I work and stand for the health and advocacy of the elderly, 
I sing and perform at senior centers, local venues in order to generate an income living in the community. Even with these opportunities, Bellingham has had obstacles that must be addressed. Let me make this clear. The Bellingham police should, not be, uh, should be considered our allies if we're looking to make change to how our police function and serve our communities. We should consider demilitarizing versus defunding the police. Even more so, I respect and acknowledge the progressive actions the Bellingham police have committed to, such as banning chokeholds in practice, requiring 42 hours of de-escalating training, exhausting all alternatives before shooting, and many and several other best practices for protecting and serving the public. As an African-American citizen, these practices are a step in the right direction towards how people are treated. My concern is that our police need more representation. And I ask our county executive if he would consider initiatives to open the ranks of the police to more people of color, representing more people from the sailors communities and immigrants as well. I mentioned these groups specifically since they are the most discriminated people of color in this area. In other regions of the country, it's more pronounced with the injustice of blacks, but there's not a lot of African-Americans here. And we are quiet because of the history of persecution we have faced in Whatcom County. Questions I would like to propose to each of our speakers tonight during this discussion is how can you use your position to make a difference? I'm new to this community. Why is there an exodus of African-Americans leaving the community after attending the local colleges and universities? Can we stop this exodus? Can there be an initiative to offer supportive employment, scholarships for education, grants to start businesses, and quality affordable housing? Will you stand with me on all of this? My reservations are that when all of this is over, the public will probably just ignore me and see me as another black man since there's so few blacks here. How are you going to make it better for us? We are law abiding citizens of our county, of our community, of our country. We need your help. We need support from our community. There's little boys and little girls that need your help too. You guys have no realization of the privileged life people are afforded here, but it's time for us to come together. We are second class citizens in this country. To survive in America, I was taught to be mindful of my conduct. I overcompensate because there's a history of African-American men being vilified and unwelcome in certain parts and places here in the United States. As far as my background, both, both, of, my college educate, uh, both of my college educated parents raised me. Both of my parents pushed me to complete my college education, mind my behavior in public, challenge ignorance, and contribute to my community. My father once told me when Freddie Gray had died in my city that no matter how successful we become, we'll always be profiled by society or even seen as disposable. My mother worries each day that I could be the next story of an African-American man being killed, becoming another statistic in the system we live in. That's the reality myself and other people who look like me face each day. Walking into a store where I have to look over my shoulder, concerned about the manager suspecting me of being a shoplifter has been my experience. I even had to introduce myself to all of my neighbors in my residency to assure them that I'm a part of the community and not a trespasser. Having an officer follow and surveil my family and I as we're walking down Cornwall Avenue is one of the many obstacles that I faced in Whatcom County. I'm optimistic, man. However, I know of Blacks and other people of color here that have been alienated because of the bigotry that ex still exists in America today. I challenge the public to change their perspectives of people of color and how we interact and respect one another in various establishments. And to finish my time, I would like to quote Bayard Rustin, an advocate for peace and equality who stood for the great orator, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said, if we can desire a society in which men are brothers, then we must act towards one another with brotherhood. If we can build such a society, then we would have achieved the ultimate goal of human freedom. In these troubling times, my hope is that Bellingham and the greater Whatcom community, the state of Washington and the rest of this nation, Bellingham and Whatcom County can be the leading example. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was a really good presentation. And thank you for your wonderful music at the beginning of our presentation. That was fantastic. Next up, we have is Shirley Williams. Shirley is a member of the member and resident of the Lummi Nation and is a registered nurse. Shirley is a passionate about indigenous people health, is co-founder of White Swan Environmental, addresses root causes of trauma, understanding that the two sectors impacting people of color and nature the most are the settler colonial legislative system and educational system under the influence of religion. White Swan Environmental Mission is community healing. Shirley addresses the root cause of trauma and is bound to protecting the sovereignty of the Salish Sea for the seventh generation sustainability. She envisions these ancestral homelands as a new age medical office for without mother nature, we do not have our health. Thank you very much, Ms. Williams for joining us. And now we'd like you to share, please. Hello, my respected friends. My traditional name is Kusamat. My English name is Shirley Williams. I'm a member and resident of Lummi Nation. I'm a descendant of Chief Seattle, lineage and see home lineage. Haishka, thank you all for being here today. I'm humbled to be a part of this panel. My maternal and paternal bloodline come from the bounds of the reservation in which we've been placed for the last seven generations. As Lee said, I'm an RN who is passionate about indigenous public health. Since the time of first contact, American Indians, Alaska Natives have experienced persistent and preventable place-based challenges, health inequities, and greater poverty and physical and mental health disparities than their non-Native. I'm co-founder and executive director of White Swan Environmental. Our mission is to support community healing through the natural, cultural, and historical restoration to the Salish Sea for seventh generation sustainability as a measure of ecological health protection for all. We are the vision keepers for an indigenous-led Coast Salish Tribal Heritage Field Institute. Seven longhouses in the San Juan Islands and seven longhouses in the Gulf Islands. We believe this endeavor will forever allow Coast Salish peoples to practice their treaty rights and inherent birth rights and in doing so offer a measure of cultural, historical and ecological health protection and sustainability that can be modeled across the United States and Canada as they also work with their community with one mind. I helped co-found Whatcom Intergenerational High School and our native-led organization advocated for knowledge, democracy, and a balance between indigenous and Western ways of knowing in the common school. In partnership, we advocated for place-based field to classroom curriculum development that honors all people, especially the first people of the land. We are the vision keepers for a house of healing, house of learning, long house. Through our organization, White Swan Environmental, I'm able to practice indigenous public health and address root cause of trauma. According to Healthy People 2020, place is where health arises through place-based factors such as stability, education, social and community context, public health and built environment. Every one of those factors has been profoundly diminished within indigenous communities since colonization and remain a challenge in present day. Since the time of first contact, American Indians, Alaska Natives have experienced persistent and preventable place-based challenges, health inequities, and greater poverty and physical and mental health disparities than their non-Native counterparts. Colonial public policy and the educational system have been the two structural systems that have established the greatest control over Indigenous peoples' inherent rights and social well-being. Today, these two structural systems continue to proliferate individual and public racism and perpetuate social and health inequalities for indigenous peoples and their way of life and well being. Combating this inequity requires shared responsibilities among all sectors, including healthcare organization and healthcare professionals who have a responsibility for health and wellness. This requires all stakeholders 
stakeholders who care about racial and environmental justice to understand the historical and legal root causes of trauma for Indigenous peoples. National source documents confirm that Indigenous human rights violations are a common problem throughout the world. The United Nations considers Indigenous human rights violations and resulting health inequities a grave concern from a public health perspective. Public health organizations such as John Hopkins are beginning to recognize the social and economic challenges for the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Analysis shows that current national policy still does not adequately support indigenous human rights and indigenous human health. In efforts to close the gap and improve social determinants of indigenous people's health, it is necessary for all stakeholders to elevate a universal framework that supports human rights. Failure to mandate such principled human rights and human health frame, framework at the government and court levels validates marginalization as acceptable amongst all sectors, perpetuating the post-colonial indigenous health crisis. The major contributor to the deterioration of indigenous people's place-based factors began with broken promises and treaties that meant to afford Native Americans justice and humanity. Article 6 of the US Constitution states treaties are supreme law of the land. However, inhumane laws and violation of treaties were created to further deny Native Americans their lands, place, natural resources, and basic rights, which healthy people 2020 now call social determinants of health. Although there has been a historical federal trust responsibility to Native Americans, these pathways to community healing have often been dismissed to the benefit of white supremacy and wealth. It is difficult as an indigenous person to speak of structural racism and white supremacy, but fortunately these terms that are being presented in academic worlds, the dominant stru systemic structure has contributed to the genocide of my people's way of life, language, culture, environment, food, wealth, and natural laws. Examples of policies that violate contexts of place and place-based substance for Native Americans include the Doctrine of Discovery, the 1830 Indian Removal Act, the 1846 Treaty of Oregon, a ruling between the US and BC in Canada based on the Doctrine of Discovery that denied Indigenous people their, their inherent rights to family, territory, and wealth. 1862 Homestead Act, where they took away our land, 1870 residential schools, 1887 Dawes Act, Act, which permits whites to purchase indigenous lands, 1978 Indian Child Welfare Act. Today in the United States and in my local community, there is considerable lack of awareness of the history and social inequities experienced by indigenous peoples of America. We held a public discussion, discussion on truth and reconciliation after a video screening of Dawn Land. A resident stated, I did not know that happened to the people in Maine, and I wondered if it happened here. This is only one example out of many. So how, how have you seen or experienced racism in our county? Yes, we all know structural, systemic, institutional, interpersonal, and ultimately internalized racism, racism is still, still here. Legislatively, we do not have truth and reconciliation or healing and honor. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is not honored here. Education, 98 to 99% of common schools are off reservations. Whatcom Intergenerational High School, we advocated for Senate Bill 5433 and almost had it removed. ELL, English language learning, is the dominant normal without consideration that 2019 UNESCO is the year of indigenous languages and 40% of the world's estimated 6,700 languages are in danger of disappearing. The health department, generation forward, envisions a future where all Whatcom County children thrive, yet our Coast Salish people are erased from our ancestral territory. We don't want our children to be bullies but there is a level of structural racism that encourages it, encourage it, is, encourages it silently to exist. What measures do you think are the most effective at helping to end racism? What changes in local government spending priorities do you envision? Legislative and educational support. We have Indigenous Truth Washington, go to White Swan Environmental. We have a proclamation that was created by the health department and ourselves, our, our uh, subcommittee. 
We have a plan for moving truth and reconciliation to mirror our friends and relatives from Canada. Educational support, Whites One Environmental, we proposes an indigenous led Coast Salish Master Carving Studio and House of Healing, House of Learning to be considered for phase two of Port of Bellingham Bay waterfront sub area plan development. The city of Bellingham seeks to foster a relationship with Coast Salish people and identify appropriate cultural heritage and education development. With stakeholder support, this proposal can be a cornerstone of Bellingham's objectives. This can be a culturally safe place to share knowledge and disseminate just practices for growth and development. We have received a grant from Lummi Nation Community Contribution and the Social Justice Fund and have commissioned a master carver to begin this work. 2020-2030 is the United Nation, Nation Coastal Ecosystem Restoration. We ask you to imagine a house of healing, house of learning, L-shaped longhouse at the shore of the noisy waters where we can begin community healing as we mirror our friends and relatives from Canada with educational, legislative and climate action initiatives as we work on our sister to sister programming. Please note that in 1852, Chowitsu brought Russell Peabody and Henry Roeder to Whatcom Creek, and he was the signatory for the Saanich Treaty on Vancouver Island. And in 1855, he was the signatory for the Lummi Nation Point Elliott Treaty. Respected elders have said, tears are the most powerful form of prayer and the water that runs from Mount Baker are the teardrops of the mountain. We ask you to help with the restoration of our village sites, camps, reef net locations, and 13 food moon sovereignty in the Salish Sea. I have to believe that the community healing work starts here with your support. Respected elders have said, the first part of any healing process is to know who you are and where you come from. And as neuroscience, epigenetics, adverse childhood experience and resilience is now showing, memory is stored in DNA. Respected elders from Lummi and Saanich have said, the creator gave us the natural law, inherent birthright, sacred responsibility to the land, to the water, to the reef net, to the salmon, and to the language that belongs to it. And if it's not supported, it is cultural, spiritual genocide. So we ask for your help. Haishka. Excellent, Shirley. Thank you so very, very much. That was informative and very much I learned quite a bit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up we have is Rosalinda again. Rosalinda is the Executive Director of Community to Communities, a Bellingham-based women-led grassroots organization working for a just society and healthy communities. Rosalinda works to promote food justice and immigration reform while building a broader base of support for rural communities and sustainable agricultural policies, all to ensure equity and healthy communities for farm workers. Rosalinda was born in Texas and spent her first decade in Mexico. Her family immigrated to LeConnor, Washington in 1960 and she began working as a farm worker in the fields in Skagit County at the age of 10. Ms. Gian has worked within the labor movement with Cesar Chavez's United Farm Workers of America and has represented farm workers on immigration reform, issues, labor rights, and trade agreements. Welcome, Rosalinda, and thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you. I really appreciate the invitation. So, primeramente, quiero, quería decir buenas tardes, buenas noches a todos los que están escuchando hoy, y agradezco la invitación de estar con ustedes. First of all, I wanted to say good evening to everybody, and I very much appreciate the invitation to be here, and um, I'm happy to be sharing these words with you in this um, time. So, I mean, I think that a lot of the questions that you asked of uh, the panelists, I just wanna say that community to community development, myself and many activists within our organization have been in Bellingham uh, leading the effort for social justice, racial justice and economic justice for Latinos, immigrants and farm, immigrant workers and farm workers in Whatcom County. We have put forth what I believe is a very intense effort and focused effort in trying to undo racism and oppression for farm workers in, in Whatcom County, in Skagit County, and in Washington State as a whole. So I wanted to just start from that moment. Many of you know who I am. 
I think that in my opinion, I have been very vocal about what is needed for farm workers and immigrants in the Latino community in general in Whatcom County. So there have been a lot of efforts. I mean, I think that when you talk about this moment, this Black Lives Matter moment is a very critical moment that has come in the face and come together with COVID-19. And it's revealing a lot of what we already knew. For brown people and black people, what is being revealed right now is something that we have lived with every day for generations. For farm workers in the United States, um, we still know, we recognize that we are still one of the poorest workforces in the nation, one of the poorest populations in the nation, and that we are a landless community that has been holding up the food system and the agricultural industry in this country for generations. So I just wanna to speak to that fact that as farm workers, we have lived the racial bias in, the, in some areas, rural areas of the United States, some very blatant racist behavior towards us. I still remember from my father, his comments and the stories that he told me about working in the fields all across the United States from upstate New York to Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, Texas, Arizona, and always seeing the signs, no blacks, no Mexicans, no dogs. So I think that, you know, we are very familiar with the culture of racism, with the culture of oppression, with the culture of what it means to be an American in this country. We also have learned our place, especially in rural America. And in Washington state, we very much recognize that Whatcom County is a rural county, that it is an agricultural county, that this county does well because of the agricultural industry. And yet for 15 years, every effort that we have made to have equity in Whatcom County, equity with the farmers, equity with the growers, equity with the agricultural industry has been met with very, um, sometimes disdain, sometimes just overlooked, sometimes just, uh, we'll get to that later. Or, you know, the most common thing is you need to learn the process, you need to understand how the systems work, and you need to know how to change the system so that you can be part of it. And I think that for many brown and black people, the responsibility has been put on us to make things better within a system that we inherently recognize is built to stop us from moving forward, from progressing, from being, from having a whole life in the United States. I just want to mention to everybody what I say almost every time I speak. The average lifespan of a farm worker in the United States today is 49. This is 2020. And it went up actually a few years ago from 47. So there are reasons for this, many, many reasons. So when you're talking about this discussion on enforcement with the police uh, and what would be what would make our life better, if there are so many issues coming at farm workers, immigrants, and Latinos in the United States today. Almost every single system that impacts our life has a very subtle white supremacist structure to it. And sometimes it's not that subtle. Depending on where you are in Whatcom County, where you are in Skagit County, where you are in the country, it is a very direct, um, what do you call it? A very direct attention calling effort is being made about who you are and what you can access and what you can't access. So, I mean, we are in the, in a period today, I really wanna thank Shirley for talking about culture and knowing who you are as a people before you can really begin to undo oppression and move forward. And I think for us also as Latinos, as Mexican Americans, as immigrants, our history and our culture has been very blatantly erased from many, many educational facilities, all the way from grade school to the universities of who we are as a people, what are the benefits that we bring, who were our heroes, what, was, what, is the, what have been the struggles that have gone on in this country. Many immigrants from Mexico come to the United States and think that nothing has happened in terms of Mexican people's struggles or, or, or fighting for justice in this country because so little of it is available to our children 
and to our youth to learn our own history. Ethnic studies has been very, very carefully removed, been removed from many curriculums across this country. We know that, that if, if our children want to learn our history, we're gonna have to teach, teach it to them ourselves. And there are very few, especially in this country, there are very few facilities where we can do that. We're in our organization, we're actually looking to try to set up our own ethnic studies classes so that our children can learn the history of our, of, of our people in the United States. So when you ask us questions of how we have been impacted, how are the ways that we think that we need to move forward together? Sometimes I wonder about that because at very critical moments when there are crises in Whatcom County and in this country, all of a sudden we're all moving forward together. With COVID-19, it's all about us moving forward together. But yet when it comes to implementing life-saving measures of rules in the workplace and ability for our people to be able to gain access to testing, um, uh, quarantine housing, and medical care, that's a whole different story. When it comes to the ability for us to be able to deal with police brutality and police enforcement, that's a whole different story. So I don't know sometimes, I really ask myself, are we really in this together? I don't think that in Whatcom County, especially because of community to community being present, that is our goal is to be action oriented and to be present in the moment when our community needs a voice, when our community needs to be represented. We have been there. We have been there in every way that we can think of is necessary, whether it's direct actions, whether it's participating in processes that majority white people have set up to try to improve the lives of farm workers and immigrants and Latino community in Whatcom County. We have been present. We have tried to work with you. So we come to this moment where I'm speaking to all of you, what does it take really to end racism? What does it take to, to really move forward together? I don't know at this point in Whatcom County. I wanna speak especially to the whole idea that you know we are a farm worker led organization because that's who i am we are members of the food systems committee that's trying to implement food system policies in whatcom county and even in that committee the conversation about labor in agriculture and in other places is not moving forward we're also part of the whatcom food network since its inception we're a founding organization and still even within that committee we are not fully recognized as an equitable player in the whole idea of really having equitable and just food systems in Whatcom County. We tried to educate you all about domestic fair trade and where farm workers could fit into that to have equity in the food system. It didn't work. So when you're talking about what is needed, especially in terms of police, we have been at your doors, at your windows, in your halls, in city, chambers and county chambers calling attention to the collaboration between local law enforcement and the border patrol and homeland security and the random racial profiling of brown people by ICE in collaboration with local law enforcement. We have brought it to you. We have brought heart-wrenching stories of what is happening with the police and, and all lo local law enforcement in Whatcom County and the border patrol. Nothing has changed. Nothing has been done. We have brought you resolutions. We have brought you um, ordinances. We have brought you ideas of how to keep the data, how to count us, how to help us be part of a community that where we can feel safe as brown people in Whatcom County. Nothing has changed. We have one ray of hope, and that's the recent creation of the immigration board. Is that going to work? Are people going to listen? We want to thank, and I personally want to thank the activists and the organizers of Black Lives Matter for really bringing up racial um, racism in, in this United States, because that helps to envelop us, envelop us also and give us an opportunity. The city of Bellingham needs to really look at its budget and its money. And I would say that in order to really change things, the Bellingham Police Department and the Whatcom County Sheriff have to admit that there's a problem. Everything that I read and I hear, there is no admission that there are issues with the way 
local law enforcement is policing our community. It has to start somewhere. We know that there are problems. We have brought those problems to you. It, they exist. Things need to change. The one thing I wanted to say is that the budget needs to be rearranged so that the city and the county funds projects and efforts that change the culture, a white majority culture to the recognition of all of the other cultures that are in Whatcom County. There is nowhere in this county where our community is recognized or is present. There is no visible sign of the Latino community in Whatcom County. No place for us to gather that is safe. What I wanted to say is that money also needs to be moved towards a changing of the culture from a militaristic culture in our community. And what I think is a white majority racist culture, which in Whatcom County is a very subtle racism. It is courteous, but it is present all the time. We need to find a way to end the fear that is sitting in the background all the time for people of color in Whatcom County. For black and brown people, it lingers wherever we go. There is a knowledge that it is very possible that something is going to happen against us, that we're gonna be racially profiled for whatever reason. We need to change the culture to a culture of no fear where we can really trust the local law enforcement that is not law enforcement, but is community security, community safety for everybody. Brothers and sisters, I just want to end this with uh, this conversation tonight with the, a memory that I have that's recent in Whatcom County that relates to the culture that exists in this county. I don't think it's that friendly, frankly. I stood across the street from Maritime Heritage Park, watching city personnel remove benches so that the homeless people could not sit, so that the homeless people could not rest and hang around those benches. They were beautiful benches that had been there ever since I can remember, since the 1980s in Whatcom County. And they removed them so that people that don't have anywhere to live cannot rest. To me, that is the biggest sign of cruelty and a downward turn towards human rights and, and the respect for humanity in our community, for loss of compassion, that a beautiful art piece of that fountain at Maritime Heritage Park was <laughs> removing the benches, which was actually part of, the, part of the fountain so that people couldn't sit. And I thought to myself, there is something happening in our community that is only going to get worse and it is getting worse. So let's just be real. I don't think that it's going to be that easy. I think it's gonna be very difficult. It continues to be very difficult for those of us that really speak the truth about what is happening. And it's got to be bigger than just the, the project of the eight can't wait. It's got to be more than that. It has to be a whole cultural shift that will demand sacrifices and we'll demand people making hard choices about where our tax dollars are being spent. But more than that, who is actually leading the spending of that money? And what are the decisions going to be made? You cannot have, you cannot ban chokeholds, but you still permit what they call vascular neck restraint. That is still an opportunity to kill somebody. We have to be honest about what we're doing with, with um, ending police brutality and how we're going to do that. And I really want to start that conversation there with a very real conversation. Things are not well for our communities, for our brown communities. At the center of all of our fear and at the center of all of our wishes for a good future for all of us, is law enforcement and it's for in its constant presence in everything that we do in our community especially in a majority white community like whatcom county so i say yes let's work together but i don't want to start from a moment of saying that everything is wonderful in whatcom county now and how can we keep that or what are the little tweaks that we can make right now i think we need a, a big shift and we need to start with the reality which is not new we have been saying this for 15 years in Whatcom County, and we'll continue to do the same. Thank you very much for listening. 
Thank you so very much, Rosalinda. I was spellbound by what you had to share, and I'm sure others are as well. And thank you so much for being who you are and what you're doing for our community. Friends, we've heard some wonderful presentations this evening, and we still have several more to go. But in all this, I hope that you remember that this is for our community, make it stronger, make it better, and it will happen. Next up is Ms. Flo Simon, graduated from North Thurston High School in 1983 and later transferred to Western Washington University in 1985 to study business administration. Flo was hired by the Bellingham Police Department in October of 1989 and served in many divisions. In January of 2000, Flo was promoted to sergeant and in August of 2006 was promoted to lieutenant and oversaw the investigations division. In April of 2008, Flo became deputy chief, currently oversees the operations division, which includes patrol, investigations, outreach, and special operations. Flo is committed to the community and currently serves on the Watkin Community Foundation Board, as well as the Bellingham Public School Foundation. Thank you so much, Flo, for being here this evening, and we'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Bellingham friends, for having me, and thank you, panelists, for uh, being available tonight for this crucial conversation. I'd like to start by just telling you a little bit of my history here in Bellingham. I uh, um, came to Bellingham in 1985 to go to Western, and I had a couple of uh, contacts with the police department that were not very positive, and so I, I thought, what a great opportunity for me to join the force in 1989 and, and change the culture of that department. Um, unbeknownst to me, when I got hired in 1989, I was the uh, second black person that got hired by the police department. The first person had been pretty much run out by, by some of the older officers that were no longer there by the time I got hired. And the chief back in 1989, Don Pierce, saw that there needed to be a change in the department. And so he started uh, to make that change. And uh, he hired me and um, I have seen all sorts of changes at the police department. I've seen all sorts of changes in our community, um, but I agree with the panelists that much work needs to be done still in our community. Um, uh, as far as racism and the racism that I've experienced, um, I would say that the racism that I have experienced has been mostly in the community and not in my law enforcement um, career. When uh, when I would go to calls and people would call me rude, rude names, obviously the N-word um, got thrown around there quite a bit. Most of the officers that I worked with were more offended than I was offended because I had heard that most of my life. So um, the community wasn't quite uh, ready to accept a black person in the police profession, but I think that only lasted for me for about five years. You know, at Rosalinda, you talked a little bit about how do we you know, how do we start to end racism? Well, racism is a learned behavior. And so for us to, to end racism, it starts at home. Um, the way we raise our kids and the way we have them look at other people, brown people, black people, all people is, is what we learn from our family. And so I have, I have strived and worked hard to address issues of racism in the police department. I've seen our training evolve. Uh, and I, I won't say that we're perfect, but um, I'm here to listen to what the community wants. And, and the Black Lives Matter movement is an important movement. And we've met with um, the Black Lives Matter folks quite a bit and listened to their grievances and, and collaborate with them and uh, address the issues that they have. Uh, there was mention made of the uh, the eight can't wait, right? Which is a more uh, restrictive use, use of force policies. And I think we've done a good job of restricting our use of force policies. We did ban chokeholds and, and strangleholds, but Rosalinda is right. Currently, we still have uh, vascular neck restraints, which is a uh, less lethal option for officers. And I'll give you an example of why it's important to keep option uh, on the table. Uh, we have officers that respond to a bar, a, a person is armed sitting at the bar, and they're able to come up behind him and put a, a vascular neck restraint on him and get him in custody as he's reaching for his weapon. Had, had the vascular neck restraint not been available to them, 
that could have ended in a lethal force um, use. And so I think we have to leave those tools um, on the table, but when you leave them on the table, you have to have training, you have to have yearly training on it, you have to be certified in it, and you have to pass and examine it. So you just can't use it just to use it, right? Um, some of the other things that were addressed in that eight can't wait uh, use of force restrictions, a lot of the stuff we already do. Uh, if you look at our policy, uh, we require de-escalation training. In fact, we have 40 hours of training on de-escalation and then we have ongoing training every year. We, uh, re we require warning shots when feasible. Not every situation is feasible. We require exhausting all um, options before shooting when feasible. Uh, we do have a duty to intervene. If you see somebody that one of your coworkers that's doing something wrong, you have a duty to intervene. You have a duty to, to make a report. Uh, banning uh, shooting at moving vehicles. We haven't banned altogether uh, shooting at moving vehicles, but it's a last resort. It's a, you should not shoot at moving vehicles. Uh, use of force continuums. We um, don't have what's called a use of force continuum. We have different force options available to us, and I'll, and I'll explain to you why. If I'm a five foot six woman, and, and a 200 pound person is uh, a, going to attack me, I will respond differently than my cohort who might be six foot two and 280, right? So I can't, the, the continuum is different for me where he, he might go hands on with somebody, I might tase somebody. So there's, you can't just go level to level. You have to use the force that's necessary and reasonable to, to, to affect what you're trying to do. Um, and we do require comprehensive reporting on, on all of that stuff. So I think, um, I think I am just eager to hear some of the questions that the, not only the panelists have, but some of the attendees have. And um, uh, we stand with the Black Lives Matter. We understand that we want to be a better community. We want to work together. We want to collaborate. And, and I think that's one of the most important reasons why this crucial conversation tonight is important. Um, the timing is, the, Rosalinda, you can have said it better. The timing is now. Uh, for us to all get together and move towards making Bellingham what we want to see, how, what we want our kids to grow up in. And um, I will relinquish the rest of my time for the next speaker and for, for possibly more questions at the end of the night. But I just want to thank you all for being here and for uh, being able to have crucial conversations together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Flo. I appreciate everything that you shared. Next, we have Mr. Satpal Sidhu, who is, serves as the Whatcom County County Executive. Satpal has been a businessman, farmer, and former Dean of Engineering at Bellingham Technical College and served one four-year term on the County Council before he successfully ran for Whatcom County Executive, taking office earlier this year. Satpal has dedicated thousands of volunteer hours to such organizations as the Northwest Agricultural Business Center, Bellingham Police, Chief Diversity Commission, St. Joseph's Hospital Ethics Committee, and Whatcom Counseling and Psychiatric Clinic. He's a Fulbright Scholar, holds a BS in Electrical Engineering, and an MBA. That Paul grew up in India and spent some time working in Canada before moving to Whatcom County in 1988. Mr. Sidhu, thank you for sharing, and we look forward to hearing what you have to share. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me. And uh, it's an honor to be among the panelists today. And, and it is very right time uh, to have this discussion. And, uh, and I'm going to say that this is not the only time that we should have this discussion. I think this should be a continued discussion like Rosalinda said, uh, and uh, Flo said, this is not a one-time conversation to, to get over our, how to, how to uh, uh, end racism. It, it's a continuous process of doing it. And uh, I think you have given my background in, in uh, introduction. I won't spend too much time on this, but I just wanna reflect on uh, where Bellingham was 
or what Kim County was. And it was a KKK town until recently. There are people alive here in this town when it was a KKK town. So it's that recent. And where we are today, that I got elected as a Whatcom County Council, uh, what, in Whatcom County Council, and to Whatcom County Executive. In last history of 150 years, the first, first generation immigrant and a person of color got elected to the highest elected position in this. So I have said, even during last year, that Whatcom County is not racist, but racism does exist in Whatcom County. Uh, they, and, and we need to end that. And, and uh, you have seen that what Western Washington University as their first president, who is also a first generation immigrant, and he's from Pakistan and a Muslim. So, I mean, these things do matter. The, the change happens slowly, but change is happening and it's happening in the right direction. We would like to see it happening very fast and more profoundly. And we have all worked together on that. In the same way that you, many of you have seen the arch of healing and reconciliation in front of City Hall, and that was also a reminder that back in 1907, that there were 250, 356 from India, Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs working in Bellingham, and they were kicked out. And for 75 years, 75 years, no one ever came to settle in Bellingham or Whatcom County, even though there is a very thriving Indian community across the border and in California. So that is another uh, uh, milestone of change that in my lifetime, what I have seen, and now I am in that position. Now, I want to bring uh, your attention to another uh, thing is, is that let's look back what the framers of our constitution were thinking. And there are three or four very important things in our constitution which have been, which have been uh, hijacked by certain people, certain communities. It starts with we, the people. It says all men are created equal. It says life, liberty, and produce the pursuit of happiness. It says liberty and justice for all. All these phrases is what our flag represents. This flag, a person having a flag on back of his pickup truck or any other way, if that person does not conform to all these things which the flag represents, then it's not right. But it has happened over time that these things have actually become symbol of repressing other people. And we must stand up to that and we must establish that this flag, sorry, I am getting another call. Okay, sorry, I have to turn my phone off. I mean, these are very basic uh, 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 premises of being an American or America as a nation. And these should be upheld and we should speak up when we see that some of the people, some of the communities hijacking these things uh, for a very limited uh, 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 purpose. Uh, now let's talk about that. Uh, uh, Flo has talked about in detail a bit about police, and uh, I have uh, been talking with uh, Sheriff Bill Elfo, 
and learning more about our training program and have been participating with the, uh, the incarceration prevention task force for the last three years and what uh, improvements have been done. Like I said before, they may be slow, not as profound as we would like, but they're moving in the right direction. And uh, there are two uh, Punjabi police officers uh, in our community. So, so, and that happened that actually uh, Sheriff Elfo came to the Sikh temple and said, we'd like to hire people from your community and please, ask young people to go meet the qualifications, make an application. They have to meet the standards. They have to meet all the requirements. But we will, we will encourage that. And we have, over the last 10 years, we have been able to achieve that. So that, that is a positive thing. Uh, we started a GRACE program and LEAD program. These two pro lead program actually received a $900,000 grant last year in 2019. And that is a program, whereas we have deputies who are trained and uh, qualified as behavioral health uh, experts, or at least in that arena. So if there is a 911 call or a situation where it is involved with mental health, behavioral health, drug or opioid, then these people accompany with the regular deputy. And there is a GRACE program, it's similar, which county and city have funded, is the similar, it is the uh, ground place response. Uh, sorry, I don't know the detail of the acronyms. But this is another program where we don't need to arrest people just because they are poor. We don't need to arrest people and put them in jail just because they have a behavioral issue or a mental issue or they are a dependency problem on opioids. I think that we can divert that and we can actually serve our community better as well as at the same time save a lot of public funds while doing that kind of work. So, so we are right now, like I, I get a lot of different uh, emails about to defund the police. I think what people are really not saying that just not have a police, there are many other reasons we need to have a police. But I think what they're, they are crying for or, or asking for that spend more funds on the rehabilitation on separating the criminals from people who have other problems and they should not be treated the same and we should be able to do that. The county has invested $10 million last year to build a 32 bed facility on Division Street, which should, be, which should have been actually completed. July 1 was the opening date. And uh, now we think that the uh, late September, October, it will be completed. And this is a place where a person uh, uh, picked up by police, city or, or, or any city or, or sheriff's office, and if they have behavioral problem, opioid crisis, other thing, they will never go to jail. They will be taken to that facility, stabilized. Now the issue with that uh, facility is that we can keep people only for seven days. That's not enough. That's not sufficient. But it does solve a huge problem, which which was not good for people as well as our community. I think that we as a community need to invest funds to have a facility where these people can be allowed to recover for three, six months, a year, and we should be able to fund those facilities. And, and the proposal I made at the start of this year was when we formed the Stakeholder Advisory Committee, to look at that, that if we do get any ballot measure and money, that the first priority should be for that facility. Suppose we get $100, the first money out of that $100 
should go to that facility. The next funding should go to prevention of incarceration or alternates to incarceration. Then whatever is left over should go to the brick and mortar facility. But COVID came, I don't think that we can actually act on that plan maybe may not be for next at least two years. The, it's not only the COVID related to health and safety, it is COVID related to our economy. So I'm gonna also do the same thing. I think I can talk another 20 minutes, but I will, I will stop for q and I think that's where people will learn more. So I'm gonna stop here and thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul. Very appreciative of what you shared with us this evening. And you're right, now we'll go to the panelists to share and ask each other questions regarding what you learned tonight. And would anyone like to start out by asking another panelist uh, a question that you might have after the information that was given this evening? So I, I wanted to talk about the last question we had. To what extent do you see the issue of race associated with problems like poverty, housing, and everything. I look at it a different way. I think that all these issues of poverty, housing, equity, healthcare, access, and everything is consequence. It is a consequence of the process of structured racism. It has been, it, the, 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 our system has been in place which has caused these things systemically over time. And if we say, just throw the money at these people, a lot of times this is what we get, spend more money, spend more money. And at the same time, no more taxes. But create the services that if you need a police, they should be there within three minutes. We should create a system. If we need an ambulance, they should be there within three minutes. Create a system. If you want a building permit, you should be able to get it in three weeks. Yes, this is the services we all want, and people say we pay for that. So there is only so much of, of, uh, of a part of money. To grow it is taxes, and we all know that how much we are against taxes. So I think this equation is, the structural changes, what has happened over the last 40 years, because I've been here only 40 years. So I'm an outsider. I look at, at America as a petri dish, you know, because I grew up somewhere else. I have lived in three different countries and I look at it and, and, and then I try to compare that, that what, what it was. If you look at when I came here, the dream of my coming to America and seeing and what I see today for my kids is entirely different because we have so much lopsided economic distribution of wealth has happened in the last 40 years, which did not happen over the last 100 years before that. Thank you, Dr. You know, Paul. So, like so what I'm saying is, is that is the issue. Thank you. Would anyone like to respond to Sat Paul's um, information at this time? No, I just wanted to say that I agree with Satpal. And part of the reason that I guess that I am the person that I am today is when I realized how this structural racism in the food system, in agriculture, had uh, brought me to this place, both politically, con my political consciousness, my learning and this place in the United States. I think it is really clear for me and a lot of the young Latinas and Mexican Americans that are working with C2C right now doing social justice work and outreach in the farm worker community and the Latino immigrant community, that when you recognize this structure that Salpal is talking about, that was deliberately built to keep us in a certain place, socially, educationally, and economically, it really hurts. I mean, I think that that trauma of the deliberateness of what happened to uh, farm workers in the United States is ever present in my mind when I look at every system that, that 
we're dealing with now, like the like law enforcement and healthcare, the educational system. I wanted to just recognize the fundamental cause of why we cannot wait. With all due respect, Sakpal, I don't think we have the time like we think we do anymore. Things have to speed up. It isn't fair and it isn't just that even now in this COVID-19 pandemic, my people in agriculture are being sacrificed, literally, so that the apples can be exported from Washington State. The rules and the policies put into place are not the same for us in, the, in agriculture as they are for everybody else. And I don't agree with that. And I, I, I just want everybody to know that I recognize that and I see it and it's not fair. And it's all the way from the governor's office to the state agencies down to the county level here. And law enforcement is involved in everything that affects my community. But I wanted to, know, to, I wanted to say, because of the other panelists that are on here with me, the agricultural industry in this country was founded on slavery, free labor. And it became rich and powerful with that. And they brought slaves as part of the genocide of the Native American people whose land the industry was built on. And then, they, and then they conquered the Southwest and they took us, the Mexican people, and we became another labor force to continue to build the agricultural industry. Now you can look at history in many different ways, but that is what I see. That I stand on the exploitation of so many people. And that is why we are still, our li average lifespan is 49. So when you look at the local level right now, when we're looking at what do we do, the changes in my opinion and what my people are asking have to be drastic. They have to be quick and they have to dramatically change the structure that you're talking about, Satpa. And that's the thinking that we have to do. What is that cage? that is built on policy and legislation at the local level that is keeping us from moving forward as a free people, as an equitable human being with the right to build our capacity to the most that we can be. It is ever present in our community. And I wanna, I don't think that we can just talk at quick, talk about quick fixes. That's too late for that to a certain extent because there are people dying you cannot, we don't even have the full numbers of the black people that have been killed by law enforcement. We don't have the true numbers. You have no idea how many Mexican people have died at the hands of law enforcement. Those numbers are not even calculated in most areas. We're in many areas, we're still classified as white. You know, so how do you know? How can you say? In Whatcom County for a long time, we were lumped right in there with white people. So are there any, um, police violations or police brutality or police uh, violence against Latinos? Well, we don't know because for a long time, we weren't counted. Even in the, one of the latest articles in the Bellingham Herald about the different ethnicities of people that are being impacted in Whatcom County, Latinos weren't listed. We weren't part of those numbers. So we're still in, in a very backwards place. And um, I, I wanna challenge that. You know, our people are not doing well. They're not. Thank you, Rosalinda. And would anyone else like to comment on what Rosalinda shared or that Paul has shared thus far? Shirley, please. I, I really feel like it's a given that, um, that there is a di di the gap between the poor and the wealthy is getting larger and larger. Um, the corporations are winning um when i think i think that's a given when i go through my nursing program that's what we learn about is the gaps between the rich and the poor and it's a given that we're placed on this reservation that they thought would be too um, muddy and not available for um, any good production so it's still happening today um, we can find all the cited information about it if we wanted to. So it's there. Um, when I think about the mental health and the addiction, I think about 
the University of British Columbia and their new social determinants of health and their um, peop their leadership up there is talking about addressing these root causes of trauma that go beyond um, the residential schools for our communities, but go to um, root cause of trauma of our dislocation from place. And then that brings me back to, um, as respected elders have said, the creator gave us the sacred responsibility to the land, to the water, to the reef net, to the salmon, and to the language that belongs to it. And it was only 165 years ago in this territory that were dislocated and disassociated from our land, territory, and way of life. Our inherent right to clean food and water is being violated. Our reef net technology, our fishing technology, Aboriginal fishing technology is known to be the most respectful, sustainable way to produce the most high quality salmon. So our people knew science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, but corporation or white people won out and now they're, are, they're the ones that get to own that technology as our people were forced out or outlawed on both sides of the border. Um, our salmon people are at, wild salmon are at less than 5% of hanging on and I'm a saltwater salmon person where our people know are considered salmon people and salmon people are our brothers and sisters. And out of 60 nations at the Royal BC Museum, we're at less than 5% of hanging on to our language. So it feels like we're in survival mode and the poverty that we're seeing, um, when you go to the furthest extent of poverty, you're looking at disaster ecologists who are now, and doctors who are now saying, look at our environment, look at the global pandemic that we're in right now. It's because we've destroyed our environment. We've destroyed our environment and we've brought this sickness on ourselves. And so when we talk about the poverty, um, if we don't do something right now, when we're at 5% or below of hanging on as salmon people, if we don't band together, and I'm, I'm really honored to be on um, this diverse panel. And I think that is what it's going to take is all of us that's why we have white swan environmental i cheated with it's not white and swan it's actually i could squish them together for white swan environmental that's my family clan and it's meant to say we one mind for the purpose of the work so swallow one one mind one heart one people so that we can address these types of issues but yes it's there and what are we going to do about it thank you thank you so much Shirley. Thank you so very much. And as we progress through this question and answer for our panelists, we'll take a few minutes between each one to just absorb what the panelists previously shared so we can gain some momentum and some feel that wisdom that's there for our community. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Daniel Patrick, who will be the moderator for the question and answer period. So um, people in the audience, you can submit in the chat room, please. And just be mindful that we'll try and get to your question as much as possible. But not everybody may get their question answered. Daniel, welcome. Thank you very much, Jay Lee. Um, and wow, what an awesome panel and what very, very powerful thoughts are coming out. Thank you all so much for your participation and, and for the provocations that are uh, warranted and, and vital and timely. So thank you. There are enough questions in there to keep us talking for months. So we're gonna scratch the surface of a few of these uh, questions and see where we get, um, but it, it'll be very interesting to see what people have to say. Um, I'd like to start out with, uh, there's been a bunch of talk uh, widely about defunding the police and, and also about the idea of decoupling police services where uh, currently, police are first responders in many mental health issues, many homelessness issues, um, many other issues. And uh, so the question is, how might we look at decoupling uh, the part of police work that involves dealing with violent criminals, which is a very small percentage, from many of the other things that are done? And could those other things be done by professionals 
perhaps more suited to that work than police officers themselves. So that it's kind of a dual question. Is this a viable approach and can we, can we make it happen? Is that something we could make happen here? Uh, I think it's a viable approach. Um, I don't think you'd get any argument from any of any, any law enforcement officer that, that says we want to deal with all those issues. We're equipped to deal with all those issues. Um, yes, by all means, fund social services, fund uh, mental health, fund homelessness, fund um, addiction. Um, uh, the, the, it will take some time to get there because as you know, some of those situations can be volatile and currently even when a uh, mental health professional goes out to make contact, they call us to go with them. So because of the volatility, but I think you can get to a trained um, group of people that can deal with those issues and and have the same outcome. So yes, I think it is very viable. Uh, when when I hear defund the police, it doesn't scare me. It, uh, you know, it, it, I, I get where people want to put um, the money. So it's very viable. Okay, so I will give a perspective. I agree with what Flo said, that this is very much possible. I'll tell you the, from the political perspective, because I've been on the council and now I'm the county uh, executive. Uh, the thing is that polit to move politically, uh, people have to work together. There are a segment of people in not only our community, all over the United States, who do not, do not believe in that? I mean, this is a fact. Who, who would say these are people are lazy? Uh, many excuses. We don't want need to spend time on that. But to, to get the funding, funding right from the county level is minuscule. But if we say the county can tax the people or city can tax the people and use that funds fund these programs. Another thing, when you create an oasis, and this has been talked many times, suppose Bellingham becomes a place which has extra uh, funding available for homelessness, for everything. Immediately, people from Skagit, people from St. Homish, everybody's saying, hey, let's go to Bellingham. They got a better gig there. I mean, sorry to say these words, but, but this, is, this is a nationwide problem, it's a statewide problem, and solutions need to be statewide as well. Whereas we try, as our community, rightly so, we press our local politicians and local administration to do something. But it is limited we can do. And to bring the, all the votes, all the people, when you go to for a ballot measure, uh, for our EMS, for our, uh, uh, you know, the uh, law and justice, for all other programs. Like they talked about the facility, which may cost $30, $40 million. And then you need a constant funding to operate it. It's not only the construction. To me, construction is the cheapest portion of, of these services or creating these facilities. It is the continuous funding and making them work. What happens is it takes about 10 years or more years to make a difference. Nobody wants to spend money for first 10 years to turn this around. People say it's useless. We have tried for two years, nothing has happened. So we shouldn't put money into this. It's a constant problem. Yeah, I'll agree with that, Paul, that um, our, our budgets are not funded to, to deal with those issues. So when you when people say defund, um, I, I don't want them to get the misconception that we get extra money to deal with mental health services, homelessness, addiction. What would happen if you defunded the police department or the sheriff's office or any other law enforcement agency is the first thing that gets cut is training. Second thing that gets cut is the, the positions of police officers themselves. So um, it's it's not like you're taking money from a fund that we have. And you're right, Seth Paul, it, it, it will take years to do. I would like to also jump in and on to the issue as well. Um, just from doing some research, I saw that um, actually our next door neighbor in Oregon had developed a program called CAHOOTS, which was a um, program that was for mental um, health advocacy in the community. And they decided to take about $500,000 uh, away from uh, their police department um, 
it had been funded for 911 um, correspondent recall calls for mental illness. Um, so it helped to separate a lot of the calls from the public for uh, mental illnesses compared to violent crimes. And they had that divided into two different um, sectors and divisions that worked hand in hand with the police. And they noticed that out of 24,000 calls that the public had to the police department, um, a lot of those calls were answered by um, a separate team focused on the mental illnesses, focused on issues that aren't uh, as violent or um, in need of uh, a lot of police support. It was just a solution that I had researched that I thought would be really helpful um, in implementing here in Bellingham. Yeah, we heard actually, um, Jonathan, we heard about that program last week and, and we're looking into it and how it works. So yeah. I, I thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, the yeah. program, I think in Eugene, Oregon. Yes. And two programs we implemented and they are very new. Like I said, just last year, the lead program uh, and the, it's, it's, it's like I said, love, love, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, um, law yeah, enforcement yeah. assisted. Yes. So <laughs> it, it is in the same direction. It may not be exactly the same program and the grace program. Both are these programs which we have funded just in last uh, two years. Uh, they are in the same direction, but yes, more need to be done. I totally agree. I don't know. Shirley, were you, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was thinking about, you know, my friends have been bringing up, I put it in the chat, one of the comments, but, you know, we've been bringing forward a house of learning, house of healing, longhouse um, for quite a while, for a couple of years, we presented it to the generation forward, the stakeholders there, community engagement fellows, so just different stakeholders throughout Whatcom County and growing this vision but when you're thinking about addressing all of these issues and you look at who we are as uh, Lummi Nation people and the different types of services that we have the wraparound services um, systems of care um, when we when I went to uh, Generation Forward and I was able to engage um, our various tribal members to attend one of the things that they had asked, you know, they noticed right off the bat that is this something that they're trying to create a model like we have out at Lummi. But when I go into the health department and engage with those stakeholders, people are wondering, well, where are the Lummi people at? You know, how do we engage the Lummi people into the broader community? And I think the, the, um, largest factor that we have is um, we don't have culturally safe spaces for our people to be. And so when we dream of being able to um, leverage our partnership with Whatcom Intergenerational High School, which is um, a new charter school that was authorized on May 30th of last year, we think about being able to create the new curriculum that will honor all people and that will honor all languages. And just think how beautiful that would be to support something that like that along the bank of Whatcom Creek where Parberries is considered for the urban development where we can have urban development that honors all people and that we can bring our um, language and our culture together as one people and create a mo educational model that can be replicated across the United States and Canada. That's what I truly believe. And when we think of field, our field to classroom development, we, so many people don't know that we, we had village sites throughout the archipelago of the Salish Sea. And so we had, we had 13 moon food sovereignty. We understood the natural resources that are growing there, but now they're being destroyed. And when they're destroyed, the first people worry about the connection to the language because the language, I have a map here that is all filled with um, indigenous language of the land. But as the, as the land the territory is being destroyed we lose that language connection but how beautiful would it be 
if we had culturally safe spaces out into our ancestral homelands or even here in Whatcom County where the indigenous wisdom that has been here for thousands and thousands of years, if we can do the restoration work that is necessary when we know our med medicinal plants, when we know what is in that territory. Um, I gave the example of the reef net technology. There's an example of the clam walls that I'm not sure that you know of at Salt Spring Island. During the Kinder Morgan environmental impact statement, there was a professor flying above and he was he seen a wall and he went to the First Nation and asked them, that looks like a man-made wall. And the First Nation says, yes, um, when I was a little boy, we would clean the beaches. And so they clean the beaches and what that does is it allows the three different types of clams to flourish. The, and the people would take the rocks, clean the rocks and build a wall. And then they would put the clam middens up against the wall and the seaweed up against the wall so that the sea urchins would come in and they would have their own refrigerator right in front of their village site. So all of these are new discoveries now, but just <laughs> think if we had the first people that were able to restore that. So you have 30,000 people that showed up for tribal journeys. Our people fed eight to 10,000 um, people a day for free. Can you imagine before our people used to operate like that, 13 moon food sovereignty, and this is the decade of coastal ecosystem restoration, how easy we would be able to restore that. So with White Swan Environmental, we've been reaching out, we've been strengthening our relationship with the bioregional federal land managers, the bioregional universities and colleges and academic institutes, and we've been working with our non-government organizations to work with our Coast Salish Youth Stewardship out in the field, and then branching that into the ninth through 12th grade program curriculum development. And this could help all of you. So imagine what could be in that big contemporary house of healing, house of learning, longhouse for all of our people of color to be able to come together and lift each other up and support each other and brainstorm ideas on how we're going to make this beautiful model together. That's what I'd like to see some of the funding used for. <laughs> I think I, I wanted to follow up on that because I think that the piece that I see when we talk about law enforcement and policing and Black Lives Matter and stopping the deaths of Black people, I, I think that those what Shirley's talking about is like fundamentally being able to look at the systems that have been created that are oppressive. And in order to create change, we need to have that, the will and the culture of peace. And that has to permeate everything, just like right now, the culture of militarism and force is permeating our communities in a very harsh way. And in order for us to move forward, even in Whatcom County or Skagit or wherever, there has to be trust from the community that what is the changes that are going to be made are going to be made, I wanna say quickly, but at least in a reasonable timeline and they're going to be permanent and they're going to be effective in really providing peacekeeping and peace development instead of law enforcement. So the whole idea of this country of laws the way that we just surrounded everything with all of these laws and law and enforcement of law, instead of the care of community, instead of the care of our brothers and sisters. And I know that we're so used to having police do this and having laws to bring this protection. I think it's that whole viewpoint and will to come at it from a different perspective where we can actually save money and have a more peaceful community and protect the environment and protect people. Right now, that is not happening. I mean, this is why all the protests with Black Lives Matter has happened. It's a, it's a moment of desperation where people are saying, no more, stop. And I think that we have to be real about that. It's, it's like, there's gotta be a different perspective in how we do this. And it can't be just about, you know, you said it yourself, it's about throwing money at it. Um, or just rearranging the money. If we're not rearranging how we think about community safety and e e 
equality or equity, um, similar to what Shirley's talking about. But there's so many lessons that we can bring forth to, to change the way that, that we um, structure our communities. But I'll tell you right now, there's no trust for my community on, on local law enforcement. There's no trust when local law enforcement is so closely tied to Homeland Security on the border. I mean, there is a whole different culture out there and a whole different communication system where people talk to each other. In order to, to change the system, there's got to be more transparency. It's got to be clearer. It's, and you know, you, you talk about how it's transparent now. All of these policies that we're talking about, that we read about banning the choke calls and the training, that doesn't mean anything if there isn't citizen oversight to ensure that this is actually going in the right direction and making a difference to the community living in every single neighborhood. If I go and talk to my community now, it, this, none of this is making any difference for the better. I'm sorry, that is the reality. There is no trust in local law enforcement. I won't disagree so, with you, Rosa. And and citizen oversight is one of the conversations that's being had at uh, at in a, in our uh, police department, in our city council, in in the mayor's office. So uh, we're looking at what that looks like. There's different models out there. We we welcome so having uh, the police look at what citizen oversight is. Is it should be the citizen, the community looking at what citizen oversight is. That's fine for too. law enforcement. So that we've got to like do that turn that around a little bit having the police police themselves and, and set up their own oversight doesn't give me any confidence that there's really going to be any change made let me follow up on that and bring in some of the voices of the 250 people or so in our audience um, there have been a, a number of questions that are more specifically addressed to police accountability accountability which is what you're discussing right now um, i think probably everybody's familiar with the concept of qualified immunity and, uh, and some people are wondering, is qualified immunity compatible with police accountability? Uh, if not, what is it really going to take to generate a high level of accountability for police officers? What would community oversight look like? Who would need to create it? And, um, and is that feasible? Can we do that here? What would it take? I think... Uh... Uh, citizen oversight is um, doable, and it, whether it's the community that comes up with what that looks like, um, I, I don't know what how that's going to work. But I think that um, that is something that's being looked at by a lot of people. And so when I say that, it doesn't mean that that Bellingham Police Department is going to uh, put together a group of people to oversee what we do. Uh, I think it's the this, the stakeholders that are out there that want to see this oversight that are going to come together and put proposals forth to. Uh, the community and and see what we come up with because I agree that um, accountability is is important and and I get the the whole police policing themselves is is um, I, won't, I won't say outdated but is yesterday and we need to look at a new way to do that and I agree that that I just met uh, actually this last Saturday with a group of people citizens on this very question. And there is a model in Sonomish County, they call it public oversight. Uh, uh, some department, they have done this a uh, couple of years ago. So they're a little bit ahead of us. And I've asked for more uh, information on that. And, and I think that uh, implicit uh, immunity, I think that need to be looked at. I think that uh, that is something which has to be looked at by police organization themselves also. It is like self-policing. If the police organization say, hey, he's one of my brothers, and at every cost and any cost, we're gonna protect them. That's what really comes down to implicit immunity. I think that should be qualified in, in certain ways and some ways, and that has to come uh, from the police organizations too, because that's how our country works. There's the unions, there are uh, non-unions, and then there is a political parties, and that's how the law passes. And we have seen this every time the law passes, how it gets diluted, how it gets so many things put in there. So this is all part of process. It, you know, we can call it wrong, we can call it bad, or we may not agree with that, but that's where why I say, all the public have to participate 
and we have to impress upon not only at the county city level but at the legislature state and federal legislatures to, to enact those changes that's that's where it starts flowing downwards you know so so but yeah i totally agree that this is doable i i believe that every policeman should be held just as responsible as the people that they are supposedly protecting and policing I mean, if the president of the United States, everybody says, cannot break the law. He has to follow the law like everybody else. And the one that we have right now currently is not. So if even the president of this country has to obey the laws, then every single policeman should be able to be held accountable just like everybody else. And that is, it, it, it's an immoral position to give a policeman that kind of immunity because that's what's created the, the environment for so many deaths of black and brown people in this country. And, and we all know it, you know, in the communities where this is happening, it's clear, it's very clear to the communities that are in danger, but also to the police that are causing the violence. So it, that's got to end, period. Wow. Uh, I hope somebody's taking notes because there's a lot of very fruitful uh, idea, ideas and uh, thoughts coming up here. And I think we have our work cut out for us. We have massive change that is uh, at our feet and overdue. So um, on that note, uh, I want to pick up and I'm going to kind of morph a couple of questions together. There's what, 82 questions in the queue. So we're not going to get to them all. But uh, uh, Satpal, you said that you said Whatcom County is not racist, but racism e exists here. And we have a number of, number of people questioning, what would it take to make Whatcom County truly an anti-racist community? What are the steps to bring a, um, a curriculum of uh, race and ethnic studies and ethnic understanding to um, elementary, secondary, post-secondary education? And, um, and can we use uh, education and awareness building as a tool to decouple racism from housing equity, from healthcare access, from uh, vulnerability to police action, et cetera? So I hope that's a yeah. clear question. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me start there. Nobody is born a racist. We all know that. No matter which community, color, whatever you are born, this is a learned behavior and we can unlearn it. We learn in our home, we learn in our school, we learn in our church, we learn in our society. I mean, that, that is the, the, the first premise of what can we do. The second thing is communication. I think that we have a drawn line. We are so engrossed with with labeling people. He's a liberal, he is a right winger, he is conservative, he is libertarian, he is blah, 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 blah. I, I have said this in last five years since I got into public, that in same day, I can be very liberal with my young kids. I could be very conservative if they ask for money I could be very authoritative if there's something else is going on. And in my business, I may have a different role. So same person putting a label and putting the person in a cubby hole. So that's where you are supposed to stay and that's how you are going to act. The other thing is, is we act to belong to a tribe. We have this uh, I don't know the English word. I speak four different languages, so I, I think in very different ways. <laughs> so what we do is, what if I say this, what would my, my fraternity, my group would say, ask of me, you want to belong to the tribe. And so you want to go rah, rah with the tribe. You don't call out your own people. We call out the other group all the time. And for the very same reason, if it happens in your own group, you condone it. That's, that's, you know, the communication. I'll tell you, when I got elected, and people know, this is not a political statement or anything, people know that uh, there was so much money put against me uh, for, for different reasons. And Philip 66, 
put in $170,000. You know, the first people I called after I got elected, and this, I didn't even get to my office. On November 23rd, the results were uh, 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 verified. And November 26th, I called Philip 66. I said, look, you guys, I would like to have coffee with you. They were a little startled, <laughs> but they did come. And we spent more than an hour. And we'd never talked about $170,000. Why would you put it? Look, I won. Look, you lost. Didn't even come up at all. We talked about, okay, here we are. How are we going to work from there? The second people I called was BP. Third people I called was Ag Water Board. Because until you reach out to people, what I'm trying to highlight here is communication. When we stick to our lines and we say, this is the line we never want to cross, I, they are my enemies. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to give them any platform. I don't want to be seen as friendly to them, talking to them, or seen with them. We hurt ourselves. We hurt our, the very cause we want to achieve is because we shut down communication. That's the only way. You know, Hatfield and McCoy's, we all know the story. What happened? In the end, they sat on a table and shook their hands after killing so many people of the both families. Anything you look at, anything you look at, that's where it ends. Why don't we start there? Why we have to go through all the rigmarole and burn our blood and go through all the litany and then sit on the table? So that's my short answer. <laughs> I just wanted to say that um, a lot of, in my opinion, ending racism or stopping racist behavior is, is, is coupled with capitalism, with making money and profit. And that brings an element of power. And the element of power of certain tribes or groups having more power than others that is based on profit puts us at a disadvantage to have those kinds of equitable discussions, um, Satpad, you know? Um, and I think that education is good, but it, it isn't the complete picture. If you learn about what racism is and how to undo it, but yet in your everyday life, every system that you have to live with and deal with is racist, is unfair or power, you know, the power structure is against everything that you do so that every move that you make, there's a barrier that is very clearly based on race. When you can see a white student qualify more than you do, that's a brown or a black student. When you can see a black consumer not qualify and the white, you know, people are getting homes and buying land and you're like constantly going up against these barriers that are set up to make you think like you're the failure, right? So you learn something, that, and educationally you can learn something, but in real life, the structure set up around you, it doesn't work that way. And I think that that's why these discussions are important and why we talk about policy, why we talk about politics, and you know the realignment of our consciousness of what our priorities really are. because out in the community there is a very real imbalance of power against people of color brown and black people and poor people and it is it's it, there's a very clear line drawn on opportunity and i think of myself my own family right and i see other families that have so much ability and capacity and you know so much potential to help the entire community, but they're not moving forward and we know why, and they know why. So this frustration gets really deep. And I think that, you know, we really need to rethink all of this and it, it is gonna take a long time, but I, but it, look at, it's, 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 it's such a, it just takes, it's the year 2020 and it's getting very painful. And the longer we wait, the weaker, 
and the more, with all due respect, um, the less opportunity we have to really move forward as a people. I'm talking about my people, brown people, right? It gets harder and harder. Then all that's left is the desperate, desperation of, because nobody's listening to us, we have to push something down. We have to yell because that is the only way we're getting attention of the unfairness and the injustices in the communities towards our people. Um, so I think that it's, it's a lot more, you, you have to say complex, but yet not. It's really very simple. The other thing I wanted to say is that the law enforcement and local police have become the front lines of, of what we see is the, is of our oppressions, of every single oppression that's coming at us. It's the law enforcement that is the face of that oppression for us because they have become the tool of keeping things in place for rich white people, mostly men, and keeping that machine going forward. So this is where we are today and why this is happening, why we're talking about police brutality and police you know, restructuring the police, defunding it or whatever. But the reality is that's just the first step in this huge structure that we all have to look at. And we can't, we have to go into it with open eyes on all of this. So education's great. We're educating ourselves right now in each other. You know, I, I educated myself just by the work that I do in the life and knowing all of you. you know, I didn't even finish high school. I only went to 10th grade. And I sometimes I think, thank God, I didn't like get to that. Sometimes it's it's depressing place, honestly, when you see it so clearly. Ah, um, so we're uh, we're getting close to the end of our time for a Q and A, um, but I don't want to I don't want to end without having a chance to uh, give each panelist a, a moment to respond to the question that's come up by a few people, which is. Uh, if we were to chart a path for change, what are the one or two most vital things we could do to move towards anti-racism or more equal sharing of power or more reduction of racist violence in our community? So it'd be great to hear from each panelist for a very brief moment, because we're almost out of time, just a quick moment. But if you could just identify the one or two things you think in the space of about a minute, uh, or less that you think would be, make the biggest change and help us move in the in the right direction most uh, efficient, efficiently, that would be appreciated. Thank you. I would like to start off by answering the question. Um, I would say for racism, um, it is a tool and it's an instrument that has been used to keep so many people um, oppressed in our country. I think the one or two things that we could really do to address the issue um, of tackling and really ending racism would be to have an understanding, a, a sense of communicating our issues and bringing them to the forefront and having an understand of, understanding of other issues that other communities are facing. Um, racism has, you know, we're not born with it. It's something that's uh, routinely um, taught. And it, it's exacerbated by all of the tools that are around us economically, such as keeping jobs away, keeping people from being educated, keeping opportunities for housing. Um, I would say that for us, we could really push to have um, a push in our workforce and in our housing to where it reflects more of that. We could have at least 20 to 30 percent of our people uh, represented in our law enforcement, represented in our uh, politics, even just seeing the panel that we have here tonight, it, it, it shows that Bellingham has all of the tools to pull each and every single community together, but it's coming from a place of understanding and coming from um, directing those uh, resources and our needs together. Thank you. So I just go back to the need for truth and reconciliation at a legislative level. Um, I know reconciliation is a real sensitive word for Indigenous people because there was never a better time that we had. So um, whether it's honor or healing that we need, but I do know truth is not told. Um, 
and that needs to be done. In Germany, they ensure that the truth is taught in school so the Holocaust is not repeated. And right now, it feels like we're at a time that we're being desensitized by this administration when we have children that are in cages. And for people of color like myself, I feel like we're, we're already corralled like cattle that we could easily be put in the gas chamber. That's how scary it gets. On the first day Trump came into administration, I stopped at a stoplight and had a man come up to my window and hold his middle finger up to my mother and I and yell, Trump is going to make America great again. And he just did that for the whole light. And I was worried about how this is going to affect our children in school because we started to feel like there was some kind of hope when Obama was in administration. And my mom said, oh, that doesn't bother me. She said, during the Bolt decision, we got shot at. And that's when my sisters were little girls and they got shot at by a lawyer of all things during the Bolt decision. So racism, KKK, we know all about it we know and and it is scary it was scary presenting at the martin luther king day wondering whether somebody is going to come in and um shoot you you know just for having a voice but another uh, factor is the educational system i wonder how do we have children who are growing up and they, uh, they violate human rights and the rights of nature. I met a man from Amazon that came up here to meet us um, because he was the last of his people to run through the rainforest forest with the plants and the medicinals intact with the tigers. And now they're in the same position that we are as Native American people. They're losing their culture, they're losing their language, their health is um, not intact because their forest is being cut down. So how, how come we're coming up with these people that have no cultural understanding for each other? I think we need to create a new model and I think Bellingham is the place to start. And I always go by spirit. So when I say tears are the most powerful form of prayer and our respected elders have said that the water that runs from Mount Baker are the teardrops of the mountain. I carry stones that tell our story. Those are suing. I. That's my spiritual guide. The creator threw the stones and, our, and created the islands for our people and the creator threw the stones and our people returned to the ancestral homelands. And so I have to have, believe that healing could start here. Knowledge democracy is honoring all people, all people, and it could start here. Thank you very much, Shirley. I appreciate your wonderful words. Uh, this, this is Satpal. Let me just add, I just wanted to say was that, that uh, briefly, learn your rights and you should vote in every election. It matters. People may not say my vote is, doesn't matter. I can tell you it matters. The other thing is pay attention to what is going around you. Don't only participate in a protest or anything, even in a re regular way, pay attention what is going on, what kind of laws are being passed, what is being debated. The third thing I wanna say is, you may not agree with the other side, whosoever side you are in, or on, on a particular issue, never stop communicating. Never cut down discussion, or never cut down, I don't wanna meet them, I'm just repulsive, blah, blah, blah. I think that, Keep the communication open is very important. And that's what my two cents are. I wanted to say that we need to recognize the structures around us again, that there are policies and structures that have been built that are racist, and we need to identify those, and we need to be clear about why they're racist. The, the removal and the, um, you know, of, of Confederate flags and racist uh, symbols needs to be very clear. And I think the tolerance of racist behavior from people that are violent and racist needs to not be tolerated. Um, the people walking around downtown Bellingham with guns because it's legal to do that is not right. The, the community tolerating that kind of violent presence that is very clearly a symbol 
and a message to, to black and brown people, you know, is, is, is intolerable. That shouldn't be allowed. And I'm very disappointed that that, that happened in Bellingham. So if that can happen in Bellingham with the number of people that did that, then we have we do have a lot of work to do. And I, I, I don't agree with that. Even if they're, you know, it's supposedly legal, there are many things that are legal that are not right. And we need to call it out and be take the moral position on it if we really want to end racism. Bellingham is a very courteous town. I've always said that. Um, I'm really uh, exhausted with the subdued racism of, you know, some Bellingham people, it, it, and especially structures. It's got to stop. We've got to do, we've got to tell the truth of what is really happening around us. Thank you, Rosalinda. Thank you, panel. You have been wonderful. And I really have learned a lot myself this evening. And I hope that this was an ongoing dialogue, probably the first with so many diverse opinions from so many different wonderful people because you are the future of our community. Your ideas, your thoughts, your content, your heart. We all need what you have. Wonderful gifts, unique gifts that represent all of us in our county and in our city. Thank you so very much, Jonathan, Shirley, Thank you. Rosalinda, Flo, and Zach Paul, and Daniel. And to all of the people that were behind the scenes, Thanks to our Veterans for Peace, the Whatcom Dispute Resolution Center, the Restorative Community Coalition, the Whatcom Peace and Justice Center for their support. And if you missed any of this, please go to our website, bellinghamfriends.org, and you can play the recorded presentation. Thank you again. Have a wonderful evening, friends. Be safe. We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do be that we shall overcome someday. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring ring with the harmonies of liberty let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies let it resound loud as the rolling sea sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of our new day begun 
Let us march on till victory is won. Let us march on till victory is won.